Now a hearing on the health effects of human growth hormone, vitamin B12, and other substances. This comes in light of a recent report alleging that such substances have been used frequently by Major League Baseball players. Medical experts testified before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. This is two hours. Good morning. The committee will please come to order. For the last three years, our committee has been investigating the use of performance-enhancing drugs in professional sports and by high school children. A lot of developments have surprised me, but none more than the fact that there's a great deal of misinformation and widespread confusion that surrounds steroids, human growth hormone, vitamin B12, and other substances. Even highly paid, presumably sophisticated professional athletes often seem to know the myths and not the facts about these substances. That's why we're having today's hearing. It's an opportunity to provide essential and accurate information, not just to professional athletes, not just to high school kids, but to senior citizens, baby boomers turning 60, and everyone in between. In previous hearings, experts have testified about the potentially deadly risks associated with steroid use. The side effects range from serious damage to the heart and liver to well-documented psychiatric problems. Steroids can be especially dangerous for children by impeding normal development and inflicting long-lasting harm. We will discuss those issues again today, but we'll also focus on a long overdue attention on the growing use of other substances. Senator Mitchell's report on the use of performance enhancing drugs in, in uh, baseball found that the use of human growth hormone by professional baseball players is rising. Just last week, Sylvester Stallone seemed to be endorsing the use of HGH to reverse the aging process. It's an unfortunate reality that what professional athletes and celebrities do serves as a health guide to millions of Americans. Even worse, there seem to be an almost unlimited number of unscrupulous scam artists ready to exploit this reality. Uh, here's an advertisement that we can see on the screen by Gen F20 that reads, HGH can actually prevent biological aging. It's like your body is immune to the passage of time. Here are the frequently asked questions from another product, Grow Lean 15, which says, our product can be taken at any age safely with no harmful side effects. Well, if any of us search the internet this, today, we would find thousands of similar sites and a blizzard of confusing claims. It's no wonder that so many are confused by the facts uh, about HGH. Today we have a distinguished panel of experts who are going to tell us while there are appropriate uses for HGH, there are also serious risks from abusing this powerful drug. In adults, HGH is used to treat adult growth hormone deficiency and the wasting syndrome of late stage AIDS, both of which are relatively rare. When HGH is used to treat these conditions, there are extensive blood tests used to diagnose the patient, and patients being treated with HGH are closely monitored by physicians. For children, HGA is approved to treat a few uncommon conditions, such as idiopathic short stature, growth hormone deficiency, and chronic, sydney disease, chronic kidney disease, it's also used to treat a few genetic diseases such as Turner syndrome and prater willi syndrome. In these cases, HGH can have a clear therapeutic benefit, but careful studies conclude that when it comes to reversing the H aging process, H HGH is more snake oil than cure. In 2002, the National Institute on Aging sponsored the most comprehensive single study of the anti-aging effects of HGH and found marginal benefits and significant side effects. It warned that HGH 
should not be widely prescribed and should be limited to controlled research studies. Another study, this one released in 2007 by researchers at Stanford University, concluded that HGH cannot be recommended as an anti-aging therapy, end quote. Well, many athletes believe they get an edge by using HGH, even though it is outlawed in all professional sports. They think it can make them faster and stronger, and they also think that it can help them heal more quickly. But there is only limited scientific evidence to support these beliefs. In fact, according to one expert, the best way to maximize growth hormone production is to get eight hours of sleep a night, not take injections. Today we'll hear from our experts that the increase in muscle mass that can result from taking HGH may actually be due to water retention. There are real risks from the improper use of HGH. Human growth hormone can elevate sh uh, blood sugar levels and cause diabetes. It can increase triglyceride levels in blood, which can contribute to heart disease. HGH can also result in fluid retention, which then can cause swelling, joint and muscle pain, and carpal tunnel syndrome. We know that HGH can cause problems because it's actually a disease when the body produces uh, too much HGH. Doctor call that disease acromegaly. It can lead to diabetes, heart problems, liver problems, kidney problems, cancer, and even death. It can also cause permanent changes in the face. We know what these changes looks like, look like. The pro wrestler Andre the Giant died of complications of untreated acromegaly, and Richard Kyle, better known as Jaws from the James Bond movies, has publicly spoken about his experience with this disease. There are also cases where bodybuilders are injecting such large doses of HGH that they are seeing some of these same problems. HGH purchased from the internet may carry additional risks. It may not be made in FDA approved plants and it may e not even be HGH. In many cases, it is contaminated with other drugs, including steroids. Because of these dangers, HGH is subject to special scrutiny by the Food and Drug Administration. HGH is unique in that doctors are actually prohibited from prescribing it for any use that has not been specifically approved by the FDA. This means that doctors who are prescribing the drug to enhance performance or to reverse aging are actually breaking the law. We will also focus today on the use of injectable vitamin B12. There seems to be a widespread myth that B12 injections can increase energy, fight off colds, and generally promote good health. The reality is that B12 injections are useful, useful for those who suffer from pernicious anemia or have difficulty absorbing B12 from their food or B12 tablets. For everyone else, injectable B12 appears to be an unnecessary needle and a waste of money. When we began our investigation into steroids in baseball three years ago, the committee's primary focus was the health of teenagers who emulate their sports heroes. That remains our, our focus, uh, and that's why this hearing is so important. But beyond teenagers, we have these widespread myths that are leading others to use these drugs uh, and wasting their money and maybe jeopardizing their health. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and I look forward to their testimony. I will introduce them in a minute, but I want to call on Ranking Member uh, Tom Davis for his opening statement. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much and thank you for your, your leadership in holding the hearing today. Athletes at all levels, from the Sandlot to the Super Bowl, look for an edge that little something extra that could mean the difference between winning and losing. Advances in training equipment and nutrition offer modern competitors paths to strength, skill and longevity not available to previous generations. But that high pressure quest for physical prowess has also spawned a thriving subculture of claims hyping the benefits and downplaying the risks of everything from vitamin supplements to steroids. Today we try to sort through some of these claims, focusing our discussion on two substances much in the news lately, human growth hormone, HGH, and vitamin B12. 
The Committee's three-year bipartisan investigation of performance-enhancing substance abuse in professional sports uncovered an industry dangerously tolerant of pseudoscience and medical mischief in its locker rooms. The Mitchell Report added to that picture, making clear that while steroid abuse continues to be a concern, the newest trend is HGA abuse, alleged to speed recovery from injuries and build lean muscle mass. Without question, those attempting to market or distribute HGH claiming it will aid healing, slow or reverse the aging process, assist in weight loss, or cure depression are scamming consumers and breaking the law. These crass, money-making schemes play on vanity and promise scientifically unproven results while openly promoting unapproved uses of a serious biological therapy. Synthetic HGH is approved by the Food and Drug Administration for a limited number of scientifically supported uses. Children with growth hormone deficiency, wasting associated with HIV and AIDS, and in rare instances, adult growth hormone deficiency. For these indications, HGH is an important therapy for real medical needs. But even when used appropriately, HGH is not without possible long-term side effects, including an increased risk of diabetes, carpal tunnel syndrome, nerve pain, hypothyroidism, arthritis, and cancer. No long-term clinical studies have been conducted on the effects of HGH use in healthy adults or in anyone at doses exceeding the FDA-approved levels. <clears throat> and those are only the known risks associated with abuse of real HGH. Even the quickest Internet search produces countless advertisements for non-prescription or dietary supplement HGH in pills, sprays, and topical creams. Consumers ordering these products run the risk of putting a counterfeit, contaminated, or altered substance in their bodies. It is impossible to differentiate legitimate drugs from fakes by just looking at them. Best case, a gullible people are only being scammed out of their money. Worst case, they are placing their health in the hands of criminals who could be operating beyond the reach of our laws anywhere in the world. B12 abuse involves similar scams, but admittedly fewer risks. The vitamins is, it is essential for normal nervous system function and blood cell production. For most people, a balanced diet captures adequate amounts of B12. Injections of additional B12 under the supervision of a physician can be therapeutic for patients diagnosed with a specific vitamin deficiency or anemia. But there is no reliable evidence to prove or even suggest B12 injections given to healthy people produce increased energy, aid in weight loss, or improved athletic performance. Nevertheless, Websites, anti-aging centers, and so-called sports medicine experts continue to flout the law and promote unproven, unapproved uses for HGH B12 and a variety of other products. Hearings like this have, have to be but one part of a much larger effort involving parents, coaches, and health providers to educate consumers, especially young people, about the gauzy myths and harsher realities of HGH B12 and other alleged pharma ecological shortcuts to athletic success. That, in the end, is what makes this oversight so important, preventing drug abuse and other physically damaging activities by young athletes. Even tacit acquiescence by professional sports franchises in locker room malpractice and quackery glamorizes harmful, even illegal practices that young, impressionable aspirants are bound to mimic. In that respect, HGH and B12 could be seen as gateway drugs to steroid abuse. We have to find a way to block transmission of that false incentive and convince young athletes there are no magic pills or wonder drugs that will grease the path to the Hall of Fame. Only hard work and the most effective antidote to illicit drugs, the truth, should fuel the bodies and minds of those seeking athletic excellence at any level. Today's witnesses bring invaluable expertise to our oversight and we appreciate their willingness to testify. I look forward to a frank and informative discussion of the myths and realities of performance enhancing drugs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Our uh, panel of witnesses today are Dr. Susan Shuren. Dr. Shuren is the Deputy Director of the National Institutes of Health, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. She's an expert in pediatric hematology and oncology. Dr. Thomas Pearls is an attending physician in the geriatric section at Boston Medical Center. He is also a visiting scholar at the gerontology department at Boston University and he has published a number of peer-reviewed articles about aging and also about anti-aging medicine. Dr. Alan Rogel is practicing pediatric endocrinologist in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is also professor of clinical pediatrics 
at the University of Virginia and a professor of clinical pediatrics at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Today he is representing the Endocrine Society. Among his patients are children who are being appropriately treated with human growth hormone, and he is an expert on the effects of HGH on children. And Dr. Jo Todd Schlifstein, Dr. Schlifstein practices sports medicine in New York City and treats athletes, among others. He is an attending physician at both the Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine at New York University School of Medicine and also at the Orthopedic Institute at New York University School for Joint Disease. He is an assistant professor at the New York University School of Medicine. We're pleased to have each of you here today. It's the practice of this committee that all witnesses uh, testify under oath, so if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear the testimony you'll give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, your prepared statements will be in the record in its entirety. What we'd like to ask each of you to do is to um, be sure the button of the mic is pressed so that it's on, and then uh, try to limit your oral presentation to us uh, to around five minutes. Uh, there's a little clock uh, sitting there, and it will be green for four minutes, uh, yellow for the last minute, and when it turns red, it will indicate to you that the five minutes are up, and we'd like you then to be sure to uh, summarize your statement. Dr. Shuren, why don't we start with you? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, is thank the, you. Is the, is the mic on? I think it is. Sounds okay. I can hear the echo. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to appear before you in my capacity as Deputy Director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm here today to discuss the current state of the science of vitamin B12 and to briefly outline what we know about vitamin B12 deficiency and the administration of vitamin B12 to healthy persons. A vitamin is a chemical substance that is required for a particular chemical reaction in the body, but is not synthesized by the body and therefore needs to be included in the diet. The dietary requirements for normal function are usually relatively small. Most vitamins that are known today were recognized because their deficiency causes recognizable diseases. Examples, for instance, would be scurvy caused by a, division of a deficiency of vitamin B of C, which ultimately motivated British sailors to carry limes on board ship, and beriberi, which is caused by a deficiency of thiamine or vitamin B1. Supplemental vitamins are usually not required by people who have varied, well-balanced diets and normal metabolism. However, supplements are often advisable for people who are on limited diets or have increased requirements for vitamins, such as pregnant women and, and growing children. Moreover, a number of gastrointestinal diseases can interfere with absorption of vitamins and cause deficiencies even in persons who have adequate dietary supplies. Vitamin B12 is required for a number of vital biologic reactions. Two of its most important roles are in the production of components of DNA and in the proper functioning of different parts of the neurologic system. Tissues in which cells are constantly dividing, such as bone marrow and the lining of the entire gastrointestinal and, and respiratory tracts, require a constant supply of vitamin B12. Normal function of cells throughout the nervous system and spinal cord also requires vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 comes from animal products and from bacteria. The stomach produces a factor that binds to the vitamin in food and allows it to be absorbed in the small intestine. Therefore, the primary causes of vitamin B12 deficiency are dietary deficiency and malabsorption. Diets that lack food from animal sources tend to be low in vitamin B12. Strict vegans, for instance, need a source of vitamin B12. However, it can take five years for someone with adequate stores of vitamin B12 to develop a deficiency after a major change in diet. Diseases of the stomach and small intestine can cause problems with absorption and consequent vitamin B12 deficiency. Some people make antibodies to the cells that produce the stomach factor which is necessary for absorption of B12 and therefore cannot produce the factor. As a result, they develop a condition called pernicious anemia, to which Representative Waxman referred, 
which can cause a decrease in the number of blood cells. Extensive bowel resections, removal of much of the stomach, or inflammatory bowel disease can also cause vitamin B12 deficiency. In all of these conditions, they need to be treated with monthly B12 injections because the vitamin cannot be absorbed from food or pills without the stomach factor. B12 deficiency has several major manifestations, a very characteristic anemia in which the red blood cells are larger than normal may progress to include low numbers of white blood cells and platelets. The symptoms of anemia include fatigue and shortness of breath on exertion. The lining of the mouth and the gastrointestinal tract can be thin and abnormal. The neurologic symptoms are particularly serious and may be hard to recognize. Difficulty with position sense, nerve damage, depression, memory loss, dementia are seen with vitamin B12 deficiency even when the hematologic manifestations are not obvious. Recent studies have highlighted the value of screening for vitamin B12 deficiency in older people with mild dementia. B12 deficiency in older individuals is probably related to changes in the GI tract with aging and fairly limited diets, both problems that appear to be more common with advancing age. Uh, for this reason, the 2005 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends that persons over 50 consume vitamin B12 in its crystalline form, such as site of, uh, fortified foods or supplement pills. Pernicious anemia is most common in older women who must receive vitamin B12 by injection. Diagnosing mild cases of B12 deficiency can be difficult. While looking for low B12 levels can be useful for diagnosis of severe deficiency, serum levels of folate, homocysteine, methylmalonic acid, 2-methyl citric acid, and cystothionine can help make the diagnosis in milder cases. The only medical indications for administration of B2, vitamin B12 are deficiency of the vitamin or risk factors for developing such deficiency, such as stomach or bowel disease or, an, a, limited di or a limited diet. Some manufacturers and distributors of dietary supplements may claim that vitamin B12 administration will improve energy levels, memory, concentration, and mood. All of these are true when the person has vitamin B12 deficiency and are treated with B12. However, there is no evidence at all that these clinical benefits occur when the vitamin is given to people who are not deficient. Vitamin B12 is not toxic when given to non-deficient persons. It is simply excreted in the urine, so you don't build up your stores beyond a certain level. Administration of vitamin B12 does not enhance physical or cognitive function of persons who are not B12 deficient. Thank you for the opportunity to provide information on this topic. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Shuren. And we're going to have questions after all okay. the witnesses testify. Dr. Pearls? You. Thank you, Chairman. Will you be sure the mic is pulled up uh, close to you and that it's on. What is growth hormone? Human growth hormone, or HGH, is produced by a pea-sized endocrine gland near the base of the brain called the pituitary gland. Its primary utility relates to growth in the height of children. Now what about deficiency in adults? Human growth hormone levels gradually decline in adults with minimal or no negative health consequences for the vast majority of the population with aging. The anti-aging industry, the primary pusher and seller of growth hormone in this country, advertises that normal declines in growth hormone cause decreases in strength, muscle mass, sleep, and sexual performance and a long list of other attributes. They go on to claim that replenishing growth hormone to levels present at younger ages stops or reverses these problems, as well as aging itself. This is a ruse. There are a few medical conditions in adults that merit the use of growth hormone. Recognizing the potential for growth hormone abuse, Congress amended the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in the 1980s and the early 1990s stipulating that growth hormone can be distributed to adults for only three specific indications approved by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. These are AIDS wasting syndrome, short bowel syndrome, and growth hormone deficiency, also called adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome. Growth hormone deficiency is very rare, occurring at a rate of about one adult per 10,000. And the legal diagnosis requires documentation of disease, such as a cancer, or trauma to the pituitary gland and a failed stimulation test. Oftentimes, growth hormone deficiency is accompanied by deficiencies of other pituitary gland-produced hormones. 
In January 2007, the FDA released an alert reminding those that distribute growth hormone for anti-aging, bodybuilding and athletic enhancement that they are doing so illegally. I have a copy of that at the end of my prepared remarks. A recent Stanford University review of 31 clinical studies of growth hormone used among healthy, normal, aging adults found the only benefit to be a slight increase in muscle mass. The documented negative side effects include soft tissue swelling, joint pains, carpal tunnel-like syndrome, breast enlargement, and diabetes. Other side effects include liver and heart enlargement, increased pressure around the brain, and high blood pressure. In the 2002 Johns Hopkins study published in JAMA, about 50 percent of subjects experienced side effects, primarily joint pains, and 13 percent developed elevated blood sugars or even diabetes. Recent studies demonstrate strong associations between growth hormone and prostate, colon, and breast cancers. In another study, investigators found that growth hormone enhances the ability of cancer to spread. It is theoretically possible that normal declines in growth hormone with age may actually be protective against cancer. Ironically, there is no credible evidence that growth hormone substantially increases muscle strength or aerobic exercise capacity in normal individuals. What about the illegal and medically inappropriate distribution of growth hormone? Since 1990, a growing network of compounding pharmacies, anti-aging clinics, and physicians have created with what some within the industry estimate as a $2 billion a year business for distributing growth hormone, a distribution network involving hundreds of thousands of weight training enthusiasts, practitioners, and promoters of anti-aging medicine, and those who have fallen victim to the growth hormone replacement scams. I personally have found websites of 279 anti-aging clinics that advertise growth hormone treatment and 26 pharmacies, or what are called compounding pharmacies, that distribute the drug to these clinics and sometimes directly to users. I have certainly discovered only a fraction of what exists out there. There's a map at the end of my remarks with the, the number of some of these entities per state. Of the seized anti-aging clinic record, records I have reviewed for the DEA, the average patient that first presents to the clinic is not a person in their 60s or 70s seeking alleviation of their age-related problems, but rather a male in their late 20s to mid-40s, weight training nearly daily and otherwise excellent health, clearly seeking anabolic steroids and growth hormone. In summary, one, experts in the care of patients with growth hormone-related problems clearly state that giving growth hormone for anti-aging or age management is not medically appropriate, particularly when weighing the potential benefits versus risks. In this modern day and age, we have witnessed the reemergence of the health and longevity salesmen. Many members of the public have been misled to believe in the magical powers of growth hormone, and because of the associated risks and other drugs typically sold along with growth hormone, this is a major public health problem. The cash-only business of websites or clinics working closely together with compounding pharmacies to turn huge profits, the national and international organizations promoting the illegal use of the drug, and drug companies turning a blind eye to how and to whom their product is distributed bear similarity to what some investigative reporters have likened to a narcotics trafficking ring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pearls. Dr. Rogel? Good morning. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am pleased that the committee has uh, taken Dr. Rogel, just pull it a little closer. Yes, sir. Okay, well, thanks. I am pleased that the committee has <laughs> There we go. I am pleased that the committee has taken the time to examine this issue as hormone abuse and misuse has long been a concern to the Endocrine Society and its membership. The Endocrine Society is the world's largest and most active professional organization of endocrinologists representing over 14,000 members worldwide. We are dedicated to quality research, patient care, and education. Growth hormone is a natural hormone made by the pituitary or master gland. Once it circulates in the blood, growth hormone travels to bone, muscle, and other tissues where it has many growth promoting or anabolic effects and metabolic effects. In children, for example, growth hormone stimulates linear growth or height. It is also important for the development of muscle and bone and the distribution of body fat throughout the body. In adults, growth hormone affects energy, muscle strength, bone health, and psychological well-being, 
having either too much or too little growth hormone can cause health problems. The most common efficacy outcome for the use of growth hormone is increase in linear growth. Growth hormone therapy employing replacement doses and modestly high doses is quite safe. Very large databases have noticed only minimal increases in scoliosis and slip capital femoral epiphysis, both likely due to rapid growth and can occur in any therapy that promotes rapid growth or just during normal puberty. The single most serious side effect is increased intracranial pressure and visual disturbance, which usually occurs in the first month of therapy as the kidney is relearning how to handle salt and water. Stopping growth hormone therapy for a few days and then beginning again at half dose is usually all that is necessary to combat these side effects. Growth hormone is also administered by physicians to promote psychological well-being and alter body composition in adults as Dr. Pearls has mentioned. Now I want to address the off-label uses of growth hormone. Off-label use usually occurs in adults in two main spheres the anti-aging market, and the body image or athletic market. It should be noted that off-label use comes with increased risk. One risk factor is that most off-label users are usually unaware of the correct doses, at least for athletes, and one can only assume that the doses administered to athletes must be very much greater than those used for the legitimate uses noted above. As I am sure you are aware, increased doses often mean increased risk. With increased doses, one might get into the range of acromegaly, as was mentioned. In children with growth potential, this might cause gigantism, but I am unaware of anyone being able to take these doses and actually pay for them in the athletic sphere as teenagers. It should be noted that acromegaly is a serious disease with weak muscle and very significant heart disease. Perhaps the most insidious off-label use by athletes who are told they are receiving growth hormone but may actually be receiving a different substance or substances. Growth hormone is an injectable medication. Magazines and the internet are replete with advertisements for growth hormone. Many of these preparations are taken orally and cannot be the protein hormone HGH for it is not active by this route. Most likely they contain amino acids, which do release growth hormone, but usually only in much larger doses and given intravenously. In fact, the amino acid arginine is administered as a test for growth hormone sufficiency. Most of the releasers are water-soluble compounds and are excreted in the urine, with the main side effect being expensive urine. Some of the compounds purported to be growth hormone may have many ingredients including anabolic steroids or steroid precursors in unknown quantities and the entire preparation of unknown purity and with multiple safety concerns. Longer term use of this anabolic agent may promote tumor growth. In addition, the vast majority of clinically administered growth hormone is made by recombinant DNA techniques and thus not from human tissue. Growth hormone made from human tissue has largely been removed from the market because of the rare but fatal disease Creutzfeldt-Jakob. Some of the growth hormone now available clandestinely is of human origin and may carry this biological agent. Also worth noting is that as with any injectable, one is at risk for diseases of shared needles, hepatitis and HIV AIDS, both of which are serious and may be fatal. In summary. There are a number of FDA approved uses of growth hormone in children and adults. These do not include anti-aging or improvement in athletic performance. The larger the dose of growth hormone administered, the more likely moderate and serious side effects may occur. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogo. Dr. Schlifstein. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, in order not to be redundant, I'm going to focus in on the efficacy of or lack of efficacy of human growth hormone in regards to uh, performance enhancing ability or, or as a performance enhancing drug. Um, as a performance enhancing uh, drug, human growth hormone is believed uh, to increase energy, uh, maintain or increase lean body mass, meaning the muscle uh, to fat ratio in the body, uh, help energy uh, and muscles recover, uh, and help recover from previous injuries. It has only been shown to increase uh, lean body mass, meaning the fat uh, muscle to fat ratio. Um, studies showing the benefits of human growth hormone in regards to healing uh, from an injury uh, have not been uh, done or done well, and there's no 
shown benefit or efficacy of it as a healing agent for recovery from surgery and or trauma. Um, however, I have seen individual case evidence of that, yes. Uh, when human growth hormone is used in combination with anabolic steroids, the effects of the steroids are believed to be amplified or improved. Uh, the combined use of uh, anabolic steroids with human growth hormone together have shown to increase muscle mass, speed, and size. However, uh, when the human growth hormone and the steroids combined were compared to studies where just using the steroids alone, um, there was very similar improvements, meaning was there was a questionable benefit whether the human growth hormone added upon the anabolic steroids really didn't really improve increased muscle mass, size, and speed. Uh, for example, um, testing performance enhancements really typically means uh, a repeatable um, exercise activity of like a bench press, which you would do, and then six weeks later without practicing it, do it again on six weeks again to see if there's any improvement benefit from beginning to end without practicing doing that activity. When human growth hormone was tested by itself and in that short interval of six weeks, it was not shown to improve uh, any uh, functional capacitance or uh, functional benefit gained during that time period when used alone. Uh, when used with anabolic steroids, there was a benefit, but it was very similar to the amount of benefit that was gained with using the anabolic steroids by itself. Um, there are a lot of limitations in the medical literature currently available looking at human growth hormone as a performance-enhancing drug, as a healing agent. Um, most of these studies are looking at it only in the short term. Uh, there's no studies really looking at someone using human growth hormone in another capacity, which is looking at human growth hormone in combination with steroids, but someone who is cycling on steroids and then cycling off, but still maintaining using the human growth hormone meaning that if they're taking both together in a cycle, which could be anywhere from six to 12 weeks of the anabolic steroid, when completing that cycle, in order to come off that, cycling off it, and then maintaining use of the human growth hormone, the believed benefit is to hopefully help maintain or prevent loss of that muscle mass gained when using the anabolic steroid with the human growth hormone. It may delay loss of muscle mass or strength during that time period, but really fails to maintain them at the same level uh, when using the human growth with the anabolic steroid uh, in combination. As regards to healing from injuries, we know that it does have a direct effect on bone tissue uh, and an incidental case reports of faster healing of fracture injuries with doses of human growth hormone have been out there, but no clinical evidence in a study-based format. Uh, however, there's also a believed potential benefit in users of it uh, in young athletic patients that they have more energy, which hasn't really been assessed and is difficult to measure, uh, improving uh, soreness and recuperation from a workout, meaning that are they able to work out better and harder because they're able to recuperate faster, and no assessment of uh, how much soreness or prevention of lactic uh, acid buildup and prevention of soreness uh, and muscle pain after a workout to allow you to work out again. Um, there's questionable benefit from, uh, from that respect as well. Um, certainly the side effects uh, that we see uh, in human growth hormone um, are plentiful as previously discussed. Um, and many of these people who are self-treating themselves and using human growth hormone in this manner as a performance enhancing or athletic performing enhancing way are finding out the side effects by titrating it and then once they get the side effect backing off. Um, you do see acute onset of carpal tunnel, large hands, swollen hands, uh, numbness, tingling uh, for acute onset, meaning they're taking too much. Um, you do get joint pain, muscle pain, joint swelling, enlarging of the joints, especially of the hands and fingers, the knuckles. Um, as the bone grows and it grows wider, as the growth plates are already closed and doesn't elongate anymore, uh, you get hypertrophy and excessive bone growth, which is not only causing problems in the short term, but also we're, getting, we're seeing patients with much earlier and much more advanced uh, degenerative or osteoarthritis formation in these joints. Uh, the bones are overgrowing tremendously and can take that strain and wear and tear. Um, 
Yes, we've seen incidences of patients with getting elevated blood sugars and continuing elevated blood sugars uh, to the fact that they're treating themselves with insulin in order to get their sugars under control, uh, and in cases turning themselves into diabetics. Uh, quite often, a lot of these websites, you'll see adjunct medications, meaning medication to control side effects, sold right next to the place where they're selling the human growth hormone, where they're selling insulin. They're selling Lasix, so you get rid of that excess water for water retention. That's a water pill, a diuretic. Um, Painkillers, they get a lot of joint pain, stiffness, anti-inflammatories, pain medicine, um, anti-anxiety medication, and then other medications to help them get stimulated in the morning so they're able to wake up after sleeping well. Uh, sleeping well is important for anyone who works out regularly because that's when your body tends to heal more and getting enough sleep certainly helps to maintain muscle mass as well. Uh, certainly with anything injected, there's a risk of uh, skin infection, cellulitis, abscess formation, fibrosis, scar tissue, um, which I've seen and seen a lot of it. Um, after a while, they start running out of places to inject themselves um, because there's so much scar tissue in there. Um, having to have areas resected because there's fluid collections in there, um, especially with anabolic steroids that are oil-based because they don't dissolve, they really don't break down and they tend to sit there and get infected chronically and have to be resected. Um, when patients are treating themselves or self-treating themselves, um, then they're usually using multiple polypharmacy techniques in order to control or limit some of the side effects in order to maintain the supposed benefits of using those drugs. Also, with a, a tremendously large fraudulent market, meaning a, a fake product out there, um, there's a lot of other drugs that are being used in replace of the human growth hormone. Um, it's very hard to distinguish uh, between the two by looking at it. Most of the companies that, pharmaceutical companies that produce this and legitimately produce this, you even have in their websites, ways to detect fraudulent market or fake products because they're very hard to distinguish. They're very well done and they're changed all the time in order to keep ahead of the market. Um, quite often it's HCG. Uh, which is very inexpensive and easy to get. Um, HCG is sometimes used by people on anabolic steroids when they're tapering off a cycle. It helps stimulate your body to help produce more hormones itself. So when they taper off, they don't bottom out completely uh, from the, having a low testosterone level. So they get a little benefit in feeling like it's working, but it's really not doing much. And then also sometimes it's combined with some anabolic steroid, so they really think they're getting a benefit, but they're probably not getting a benefit from that. Um, Dr. Schlifstein, yes. let, me, let me stop you there because yes. uh, I wanted to ask some questions and start yeah, off sure, the questions sure. for the uh, five minutes that each member will have. Uh, we, we've heard a lot of attention on steroids because steroids does, does enhance performance. Isn't that accurate? Yes, that's an accurate statement. Uh, but it has very dangerous side effects. And we know that if children use it, it can even cause psychiatric problems as well as other medical problems. There's also a test. So if an athlete is using a steroid, it can be detected in the urine. Human growth hormone, on the other hand, cannot be detected by any test that we know of at the present time. Isn't that accurate? Yes, at the present time. Um, there's pending stuff working. Uh, People are working on it, but yeah. some athletes believe that if they use human growth hormone, it's going to increase their performance and they won't get caught. Right. Are they mistaken? Does it increase their performance? Well, the, the, the reason the, it has that appeal that way is because you can't detect it. And if you're on like a steroid and you stop it, you're trying to falsely inflate yourself and thinking that you're going to maintain the benefits you've got from the steroids and hopefully mm -hmm. make it longer lasting. It may help a little bit in the short term, but that effect, is, I think, is going to be very short-lived. Well, like th that's a short term in conjunction with steroids. Right. But I'm saying when right. you taper off, you're going to try to hold on to that benefit, but right. it's really not going to hold that muscle mass. A lot mass. of them are using it instead of steroids. Do steroids. Dr. Rogel, uh, there is this widespread belief that uh, using human growth hormone can um, increase your muscle mass. Uh, does it make you faster? Does it make you stronger? Well, this is the second time. That's two out of three for the Olympics, Citius, Altius, and Fortius. 
higher, stronger, and faster? And the answer is probably not by itself. And so uh, as you look at Sylvester Stallone and say that's a different body for a 61-year-old man, he may very well have been taking growth hormone, chintropin, that he said he was taking. None of us in this room knows what else he was taking. And I think it's the what else, uh, meaning anabolic steroids, that made the difference. There well, is, yes. sir, no question that there is a lipolytic, that is fat breakdown effect and mild anabolic effect. So if you're a bodybuilder and you want that ripped look, that might make sense. But that's about the only place there are no studies and people who are honest to goodness growth hormone deficient given growth hormone legitimately that shows that their strength is very much better and certainly no performance data, sir. Well, some people believe it's going to make them more ripped and stronger and faster and more able to perform. What risks are they taking? Well, if you are an adult, most of them have been uh, mentioned by the two uh, gentlemen who flank me. The major risks are, uh, first of all, early on, the edema, muscle aches, uh, joint aches, and remember, sir, these are anabolic hormones. They lead to the production of insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, which is really pro-growth of tumors. So the aging population, whether it's men like we are in prostate cancer or women with breast cancer, uh, harbor smaller early tumors, earlier tumors than uh, uh, the older people, and this may just lead to their growth. Theoretical to be sure, but absolutely true in vitro. In a dish, you can show the effects of growth hormone, but especially IGF-1 on that particular biological effect. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Pearls, you know a lot about human growth hormone. If a young athlete were asking you uh, whether he should take it, because he thinks it will increase his muscle mass, lower his fat, and help him be a better athlete, what would you say? Firstly, that's certainly not worth the risk. And secondly, um, you know that I would hope that we would go about these things in an honest way. One of the dangers of the athletes or entertainers taking this stuff is providing uh, a very bad example for all these young people, certainly. Um, there are no clinical studies showing the long-term um, risk in terms of cancer, but certainly short-term studies show that there is substantial risk. Um, I think kind of the bigger picture is, is that we have an anti-aging industry and other areas of the market that do an unbelievably uh, good job of marketing uh, an incredible false sense of safety and an incredible false sense of tremendous benefits from these drugs. And out of that comes a huge amount of money, $2 billion a year for these hucksters. Um, I think that there's, you know, if you look at the internet of blogs where a lot of these athletes or bodybuilders are discussing what to do in terms of the recipes and cocktails and what have you, Everybody's just kind of playing a guessing game and saying, well, this works and this works, this doesn't work. Don't do this because you'll get caught. It's really almost a cult-like presence. And, um, and nobody is really making any decisions with the help of uh, caring physicians like from the Endocrine Society or elsewhere that really understand the risks and benefits. They're not relying on the science. They're relying it's, on mythology. And I think a lot, and there's is, also is a big a question statement? of how much of this is placebo. Yes. And, and they're, again, they're not just a danger to their bodies, it's a huge danger to their pocketbook. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the people that are taking this stuff, they're not getting the lab tests, they're not being well followed. So they are really a danger of uh, developing really significant heart disease, for example, not so much from the growth hormone, but I very rarely have ever saw growth hormone taken in isolation. Um, it's you know, almost always given with a lot of other drugs, anabolic steroids, HCG, Arimidex, all kinds of drugs. Um, so it, it's really amazing to me that they can take all these things. They're not getting followed by any lab tests. They're not really being followed by a physician. Um, they're really putting themselves at significant danger. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess I'll start off with B12 since 
That's a relatively new part of our investigation. Dr. Shurin, uh, you spoke most, uh, mostly on B12. Let me, let me ask it, uh, if you will, on behalf of the vitamin industry. Mm -hmm. uh, medical professionals, uh, by, by and large, will tell us that the, whatever it is, several billion dollar industry from one a day to every other vitamin just gives you expensive urine. Uh, is that a generalization that is pretty darn accurate that uh, the medical industry and the science industry and certainly pharma tells us that there's very little benefit to most uh, vitamins, particularly oral? Yeah, I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the shotgun approach in which you just give lots of vitamins because for the most part, more doesn't do you any harm. There are situations in which it does. People tend to take it rather than figuring out how to eat a balanced diet, how to get vi vitamins in the ways that are, are far better for their bodies. bodies. Uh, a little bit uh, like the medical profession tends to give antibiotics without knowing exactly what, what the infection happen, happens is, too. All, happens all the time, yes. Well, the reason I want to focus on that, uh, from a practical standpoint, B12 simply is another vitamin that a vast, vast number of people believe will help them. Right. Uh, now, I happen to have a mother who, during most of her premenopausal days, was getting them various vitamin B supp uh, supplements by injection by my own first cousin, who was our family doctor, who thoroughly believed that this was something that was helpful for her uh, persistent anemia. Uh, he may have been right, he may have been wrong, but uh, I grew up with those injections. Is there any reason for this panel to get involved in a multi-billion dollar industry and debate the merits of vitamin supplements in general here today that would be, that w where we'd be effective? We have in the past weighed in both this committee and the chairman's other committee and my other committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee. We, we've gotten involved in the vitamin industry and at the end of the day, it's still a conundrum. Would you say that's roughly correct? Yeah, I think there, there's several issues here. One is that <clears throat> that many of the vitamins, uh, the sort of the evolution of discovery of these vitamins is people gave cocktails, like all the B vitamins sort of came together. And so you could only give them together. And then as you dissect it out, you now have a, a lot more components. So it's very, it's a common practice for uh, for many older practitioners to give these sort of cocktails. Um, the, the biggest danger for situations in which they're given uh, without a clear understanding of what you're giving them for is that you may not, if you actually have a problem, is that you may not be making the underlying diagnosis. Uh, for instance, one of the common uh, situations as you're describing with your, with your mother is, uh, is that the, the, the the person may have a mild hematologic disease such as beta thalassemia minor, which is an inherited blood disease. It doesn't get better no matter what you give. And the biggest problem is that there's an anxiety that's associated with it because I've got anemia and is that, does that mean that there's something serious? Yeah. The vitamins themselves generally don't hurt. Excess vitamin, uh, excess iron, of course, can hurt. I would, I would say that uh, the, the major damage that's done is the failure to diagnose and to treat significant problems and then okay. just the, the costs. Okay. Uh, and well, I, because so much of our hearings have focused on athletics, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to assume for today that the taking of vitamins by athletes of all levels probably is so benign as to not be a major part of, of what we should be looking into today, that would and be rather nice steroids and human growth hormones are, which brings up uh, a real point that I'd like to make in the remaining time. Uh, it appears as though this committee's good work under both the chairman and ranking member have led to professional and amateur athletics doing testings for uh, steroids, and I think that we should all be very proud that that's happened and happened without legislation. However, it appears that since there's no test for human growth hormone, and it appears as though there is a legitimate, and let me rephrase that, there is a reason that people would think that it works as part of an ongoing attempt to e evade uh, detection, that we need, this committee needs to look at the development of a test for human growth hormone, uh, perhaps federally funded. And last, if and anyone can answer that disagrees, but 
uh, whether it's Sylvester Stallone, Jesse Ventura, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Hulk Hogan, two of whom became governors, it appears as though there is, unfortunately, a tendency for the good-looking body on the runway to be part of both steroids and human growth hormone. And up until now, we really haven't, as a committee, attacked that because basically looking good on the runway, looking good running for, for uh, well, the chairman looking good running for re-election in, in Hollywood and Los Angeles has, has not, and, and he does look good, and he does get elected by wide margins with uh, Hollywood and Beverly Hills. So I guess- It ain't, if it ain't my looks. <laughs> it could just I, be the physique, though. I, I would say that- But if you, you would comment on the fact that that, as of right now, has not been successfully looked at, uh, in other words, outside of athletics, we're not presently testing, and uh, we do have at least two governors uh, who uh, had incredibly good-looking bodies that may have contributed to their elections. Gentlemen, yes, time sir. is up, but let, let's uh, see if the uh, panel wants to answer any of these uh, points. In full disclosure, I am working with both USADA and WADA on the growth hormone testing. There are certain things I can say, there are certain things I can't. They are working. Well, we can keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> is this the IRS? <laughs> uh, it is uh, a blood test, first of all, number one. And number two, so there are a lot of difficulties with uh, labor contracts, what you're allowed to do and what you're not. There are some very good tests uh, in the urine that prove you can't find uh, HGH uh, in the urine. So while there are no tests that are presently available that will show HGH use beyond a couple of weeks, there indeed are tests and they are in the mill uh, that pass the uh, International Olympic Committee's standards, sir. Thank you very much. Uh um, Dr. Pearls, you want to make a quick comment? Another interesting idea would be to compel the pharmaceutical companies to add some kind of inert marker to the drug so that it does absolutely nothing in terms of biological activity, but it would be easy to detect. This could be with growth hormone, it could be with anabolic steroids and so on. That would be a little difficult to compel Chinese makers of the growth hormone, but hopefully the government has other ways to interrupt the flow of that but that might be another idea to pursue. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Ruggle, the, um, you know, as we sit here, um, we have national surveys, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, that tell us that as many as 4 percent of high schoolers are taking anabolic steroids, and as many as 5 percent, 1 out of 20, are using human growth hormones. A recent uh, confidential survey of kids in grades 8 to 12 is even more disturbing. Over half of the kids who have used steroids said that pro athletes influenced their decision to use those drugs. Does that surprise you at all, any of you? No, I've looked at the data. The data are anywhere from 2 to even up to 12 percent. But I think the issue about HGH is not correct. And the reason is many kids think they're taking HGH, and when you ask them, they're taking something by mouth. That could not be HGH. The wallet test is probably the most difficult test for the teenage athlete to pass. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars for a year. So I think the abuse of honest-to-goodness HGH mm -hmm. is really quite a bit lower. The steroid numbers are exactly in the range that you mentioned. The fact is, is that is, uh, those steroids are harming our children, though. I believe so, yes. And the fact is, is that I think sometimes the media uh, concern me because they seem to think that the, the committee is just uh, showboating. And the reason why we started these hearings from the very beginning is because we were concerned that young men and women were taking these substances trying to emulate uh, their sports heroes. And here's the most concerning part of the survey. It said three of every five kids using steroids we're also willing to take it even if it shortened their life. Yes. That's deep. It is. It goes back to A.E. Hausman to an athlete dying young. It's exactly the same phenomenon. If they could win a gold medal, they didn't care what happened 10 or 20 years down the road. Yes, sir. Is that, uh, doctor, because of this, you know, when we're younger, we have this in, uh, you know, we feel that we can do anything and we, we or is it just that, are we going for the, the goal, are we going for the glory? 
and figure when we get to glory, it's okay that we just burn out? I mean, is, I mean, what is that about? Is it, and is, it, is, is it something to do with a person just being young and not understanding, as one of my uh, people in my district once said to me after they had used this kind of stuff, he said, I used it, and he said, I can forgive myself, but my body won't forgive me. I mean, is it, is it, is it that kind of thing, Don? Well, I'm not sure it's quite, uh, it's a, that's a very telling comment, but remember we're talking about adolescents. I deal a lot with adolescents. They are invincible. We all were. Never mind voting yes, but we all were. But the point is, you know, the brain isn't fully developed. And so the executive function, the uh, frontal lobe part, that tells you, hey, you might not want to do this because of the consequences, isn't so developed. And so you have the push to take it, and you don't have the pull back. And so the immature, even that's an a adolescent, the immature brain is a bad thing to have, by the way. So, you, so you, the immature brain says, uh, take me. Is that what you're saying? Yes, this is Alice in Wonderland. All right, it's all right. <laughs> and, then, so the, and, and then the immature brain also says, uh, hey, you know, we're doing pretty good. Let's not go backwards. Is that? Well, I don't know about let's not go backwards. Let's not look forwards is probably a better way of saying it, Mr. Cummings. I got you. Now, let me just go to your testimony. And I saw in your testimony that there is a long list of legitimate uses for children. Uh, of, uh, and some of these diseases have names I'm, I'm not even sure uh, how to pronounce. Uh, so can, can we simplify this list by saying that Growth hormones is used for kids who are not growing enough, is that? Well, that are not growing enough for reasons that are stated here. Kids who are caloric deficient also don't grow well. Growth hormone would not be an appropriate drug. So it's not growing well or normally and having one of these conditions in double blind trials or at least in legitimate trials, the FDA has approved the use of growth hormone in these conditions, most of which are rare as can be. And I mean, and when you say rare as can be, can you give me some numbers? Uh, yes, I'm trying to I figure can. out if somebody would be using these things and. Gr growth hormone deficiency is about one in 4,000. Chronic kidney disease is probably about the same. Turner syndrome is one in 2,500 girls. Small for gestational infants who fail to catch up to normal growth is um, probably one in 5,000. Prader Willi is more like one in 15,000. Idiopathic short stature is the bottom 1%, so it's one out of every 100 of us. Um, Shock's haploinsufficiency is a gene problem. That's about one in four or 5,000. Noonan syndrome is about the same. On average, between one in 4,000 and one in 10,000, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Bilbray? Oh, let me go. Oh, uh, Brian, let me go next. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I think this uh, sheds a lot of light uh, uh, on the situation. Uh, one of the difficulties is even if you think HGH and B12 can do the job uh, with this mail order stuff, you're not sure what you're getting. Isn't that one of the problems? It's a huge problem, isn't it? And so contaminants get into the system very, very uh, quickly. Um, I'm trying to look at this B12 problem. This has come up before this committee before. We had a situation. Uh, a year ago, where a couple of years ago, where uh, one of the ball players tested positive for steroids, thought he was getting a B12 injection, and this seems to be fairly commonplace, where athletes get B12 injections and thinks it can do something. We've talked of uh, uh, what, what, what is, are there any adverse effects of getting a B12 shot, Dr. Sheeran? Uh, no, there there really are not. Really it's like not. drinking too much V8 or something like that. Yeah, so. pr pretty much, pretty much. And there's absolutely no interference in the assays for B12 and steroids because one of the things that's implied by some of this is, is well, if I weren't taking the, it, it, it gave you a false positive test for steroids uh, or any or, or other substances that actually is not is not possible. Now right. many of these substances are coming in not through tested and legitimate sources, and it's anybody's guess. So again, the problem with B12, particularly through the mail, is you don't know what you're getting. It's That's not correct. FDA regulated or anything else. That's correct. Else. If you're really getting B12, it's not it's not harmful. Have any of you ever encountered a situation or a, a patients or no patients who thought they were getting? Uh, uh, one drug through the mail, particularly a B12 or HGH, and ended up getting something that was contaminated? Absolutely. Yeah. I've tested it. Uh, 
It was um, HCG and anabolic steroid combined in a powder that looked identical to the human growth hormone. And, and, and uh, was it, would it have been harmful had somebody injected it, you think? Well, if, if someone thought they were getting human growth hormone, it would have an effect, but it wouldn't be the effect from the human growth hormone, it would be the effect of the right. anabolic steroid combined with the HCG, which would enhance it somewhat. Okay. And if you were a woman, it would be much worse. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. For a woman, if she thought she was getting that, that could have uh, dramatic secondary sex characteristics, deepening her voice, facial hair, excessive weight gain, <laughs> Uh, you got to get that out there. That'll stop it real quick. Yeah, acne. Well, well, I had a woman whose husband was buying uh, steroids online. Didn't tell her. They went away on vacation. He put his pills in her sleeping pill bottle. She took them for a week thinking they were her sleeping pills. In a week, she grew facial hair, beard, deepened voice, gained 15 pounds, um, acne, uh, clitoral hypertrophy, just from one week. Six months later, it still never reversed itself. Wow. 25 years old just by taking it accidentally for a week. Yeah. Uh, so this stuff is dangerous. Yep. Uh, on the HGH side, we talked a little bit about some of the side effects uh, from uh, using that, um, not just contaminated, but using regular human growth uh, hormone. Um, there are a large and in, in, in growing number of websites um, marketing HGH injections. How do you respond to proponents of HGH that believe it's a safe alternative to steroids? Go ahead, Dr. Pearls. Uh, there are thousands of websites. You put in human growth hormone or HGH and anti-aging into Google and you get uh, somewhere in the range of a million five hundred thousand hits. Um, and I'm not so sure they market it as an alternative to growth hormone. They just I mean, to steroids, it's just a, um, a, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, it's really snake oil. It's, it's, it's the fountain of youth. And they push this to the hilt. Um, in, term, in terms of the medical records that I reviewed for the DEA, I almost, however, never saw growth hormone given in isolation. I think the reason for this is because the clients would never see much of any benefit. And they would wonder, well, where is my $1,000 a month going? And so they see the growth hormone combined with all these other drugs that we've been talking about. Um, just the other very interesting thing that I saw with these clinics is that the compounding pharmacies were, in fact, giving the growth hormone with B12. They would write a prescription that said somatropin and B12. And the only reason that I can think of for them doing this is trying to get around the law a little bit, um, because giving growth hormone for anti-aging, athletic use, or bodybuilding is illegal. There's no such thing as legal off-label use. The Secretary of Health and Human Services says that in adults it can only be used for three purposes. Um, maybe the compounding pharmacies are trying to skirt around the law a little bit by saying, well, we're doing very individualized therapy. We're trying to produce something that's in individualized for that specific patient. But it does not get around the fact that that patient has requested it in the setting of an anti-aging clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just so I, the human growth uh, hormone doesn't really do anything for performance enhancement taken alone, correct? As yeah. far as studies have gone, I'll let my partners uh, say more, as far as studies have gone, no. But remember, for those of us who do remember, when the anabolic steroids came back, we as physicians were the worst actors of all. We said steroids did nothing. And then there were some proper double-blind studies done by Dr. Bassin, who's at your institution, and they do work. So uh, there are no studies that show unequivocally, or not even really equivocally, well, I think also the studies that are available don't look at it in the way it was intended to be used, meaning um, they're looking at taking that in isolation by itself, testing before and testing after to see if there's a change in performance. And that's not really its uh, intended use by its users, meaning it's used usually in conjunction with something else. Like uh, a steroid. You're right. To maintain, hopefully, that benefit from the anabolic steroid, uh, to amplify the effect while you're on the steroid. And when you're off the steroid, hopefully to maintain those benefits. And it really wasn't looked at in that way. Also, it wasn't really looked at as uh, how it affects individual performance, meaning 
are you able to tolerate more of a workout? Are you able to tolerate more muscle recuperation from that? And just like uh, something like creatine, which is an acid buffer, allows you to work out more because you can tolerate more lactic acid buildup. Does that allow you to tolerate more working out and working out sooner? That has a benefit in the longer term, but immediately but by itself, nothing. The research on the, the harm that it does seems to be a little more advanced. Is, is Absolutely. Right. Now, all these advertisements that we've seen about uh, people aging, this is going to reverse the aging process. This is the fountain of youth on that basis. Uh, even some uh, well-named actors uh, trying to indicate to people that anybody over 40 should take it. Um, is, and, they, and they indicate in those advertisements that uh, they believe HGH actually causes aging. It doesn't cause aging, does it, well, Dr. Perl? Um, I could speak to that. The, uh, um, they claim that growth hormone levels drop with aging, which is true, and therefore the growth hormone causes aging. Aging is caused by multiple problems involving our uh, hits to our DNA, uh, our cells, um, chronic damage to many different entities of our body by free radicals and so on. It's not caused by declines in growth hormone or other substances. Does it um, do anything beneficial to uh, regarding aging at all? Say again? Does it do anything beneficial regarding aging? In fact, my guess is that um, it does bad things with regard to aging. Studies in lower organisms in mice show that animals that are deficient in growth hormone actually live 30 to 40 percent longer. These animals also have markedly reduced rates of cancer. So it actually probably does the opposite effect. And it, it sounds to me from your testimony earlier that the, the concerns we have with respect to women using HGH is even more pronounced uh, than with males using it. Is that also correct? No. Um, no. I'm not so sure. There are other hormones that some of these anti-aging clinics, you know, what the, the clinics uh, make their bucks on what they call hormone replacement programs. And it's multiple hormones from steroids, and, which are basically testosterone or variations of and, and growth hormone. And it's really the anabolic steroids where we see the untoward effects, with, in women in particular. Right. And you, you, you announced the, uh, the, in, the problems for women using the HGH earlier, and I, I won't go over. You keep shaking your head, doctor. Is, am I getting it wrong? What my colleague to the left mentioned were the problems with steroids sure. in women, right. not with HGH. That's right. why I was shaking well, my head. Are there head. any problems with women, uh, in particular, using HGH? Uh, as compared to men differentiating, I haven't seen any uh, sexual differences between one and the other. Okay. So the whatever problems um, exist for men taking it would it be for women as well? Right. I mean, with testosterone, the, the women's uh, receptor uh, is like 100 times more sensitive than the male. So well, even a low dose of something that is testosterone um, can have much amplified effects in women that may not reverse themselves even if taken off. And that's an anabolic steroid. That's not human growth hormone. Right. Yes, Mr. But one concern would be the one out of nine women that go on to develop breast cancer. And uh, taking growth hormone for any woman, uh, when you're looking at that kind of prevalence, would probably be a very bad idea. And there's studies to show that, particularly with a breast cancer tumor, that one of the events to allow that breast cancer to spread is when it starts expressing its own growth hormone. So this is just a really bad idea. Good. Well, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Yes. Um, Todd, in your testimony, you were talking about taking, uh, administering which substance um, after doing a bench press? Um, that's one of the typical tests you do for performance enhancement. So there were studies looking at the efficacy of human growth hormone used in combination with anabolic steroids versus anabolic steroids by themselves and looking at that at day one and then day six. Um, there was a slight benefit uh, from using the human growth hormone when used with the anabolic steroid as compared to just using the anabolic steroid. So in that scenario, when combined with an anabolic steroid, it did have some performance enhancing effect. Not in isolation, only when used with combination of something else. But the growth steromone, uh, the hormone itself, um, you stated that after the workout, the administration of of the substance, after a period of time, there was no net difference between the um, the application of the growth hormone and not and and without it. Right. When just looking at pure uh, performance enhancement assessment from day one to day you know week six, uh, growth hormone versus nothing, there was no benefit in, in a test of pure performance enhancing 
in that time frame? Well, doctor, I, I think any you know, sophomore in high school would tell you if he was an athlete, uh, an athlete that you, that's not a, they would perceive that not being worth the paper it's written on because they're exercising, working out at least three days a week. They're going through extensive weight training and the perception would be then do we do these tests showing that the use of the hormone um, or um, during regular training sessions where at least three times a week there is extensive workout, you know, um, strain to the muscle mass. Do we do that kind of t real world testing that these kids are perceiving that they're, they're going to go through? That's what I said. I really don't think this testing appropriate to what we're really looking for the potential benefit of. It's looking at uh, a benefit in the shorter term and anyone who t uh, takes it will tell you that's a more longer term benefit uh, and even uh, by itself or potentiated by something else. So I don't know if that assessment tool really applies to that by itself uh, is really applicable and not to draw too many conclusions by that just by saying in the short term. Well, I'm glad to say you, you brought that up because I think that that's what's really critical that when we bring data forward to be able to persuade young people to stay off of this stuff, we need to make sure we have a credible argument that they will accept. Right. And I don't think any of, any of my uh, kids would look at this and say, well, yeah, Dad, well, of course, if you're not working out, you're not going to get any benefit from, you know, this is a supplement to a major workout program, so it has to be real life. And so I just hope that when, you know, we're really careful that when we give the argument why kids should stay away from this, it's one that's very defensible, is not able to be assailed or justified. I, the flip side is I'd kind of tell them that, look, you're working out anyways, you're going to put muscle mass on, and yeah, there might be a placebo effect. Um, but until we do those kind of real world testing, our um, ability to sort of argue the point um, is diminished to some degree. These kids are not idiots. Um, right. The fact is they may be getting into this drug and that's stupid, but still, as, the, as they said, the, the, uh, uh, some parts of the brain haven't developed, but other parts are very well developed and we got to make sure that we approach this with an intelligent argument because once our arguments get debunked, then we're really in trouble trying to give science to these kids. That is where then the guy who's pushing the drugs and pushing the substance really is saying, see, they're really not giving the data and here's the argument. There's already enough um, bad propaganda out there already. I just hope that we, we have the substance. And so, I, I mean, have the substance in our argument. Um, do we, uh, are we testing real life application? Do we have that data so we can show these young people, look, here's an athlete working out here and here's the application over here. This is your life because any high school college student is going to tell you, you know, doing one set of bench presses, taking the injections and then waiting for a month is not my world. I'm working out three times a week extensively and I'm just looking for something that will give me that little edge. I'm not talking about a, a silver bullet that's going to do it all for me. Do we have the ability to give them that kind of information? I mean, I think we have the ability to give them certainly uh, the downside, the side effects. I don't know if we have enough ammunition uh, to be convincing by itself. I think that would be a little more difficult, but certainly uh, it makes it more difficult when you have other people endorsing it by using it and saying they're using it. It's certainly making it that much harder for your argument to say this doesn't work, and, but someone else is saying I'm using it like that is very hard to counterproduct. Especially for a kid who's not looking at long-term side effects, I'm going to get arthritis or diabetes later. He's looking short-term. You know, let's face it, all of us will admit that the statement, if I knew I was going to last this long, I would have taken better care of myself, <laughs> is sort of a universal term. <laughs> and so, Mr. Chairman, I just hope that we, you know, and I, again, the fact is that they are not in a position to make the best judgments of anybody in the world, and then they've got the ambition of success, um, which we all can suffer from. And then uh, I just hope that we give them a lot more data than just this could hurt you when you're an old guy. Their attitude is I could give, you know, I'm not looking forward to that. That's how many, how many young people we still see smoking the cigarettes and when, you know, my God, if we can't get them off cigarettes, um, this is a hard argument to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the ranking member as well. Uh, following up, and, and I want to thank our panelists uh, for helping us out uh, with this issue. Following up on Mr. Bilbray's uh, line of questioning, uh, we have a hearing tomorrow regarding Major League Baseball, which 
HGH is an important issue and a, and a significant danger in itself, but I think the hearing tomorrow has, has provided added focus. It has provided some context, I believe, and, and I think in a way the problems in baseball uh, are, I think, instructive as to the, the wider problem in society. In, in baseball, we had a situation where, let us take steroids, for example. Uh, Major League Baseball came back and they had a, a greater awareness program, a greater acknowledgement that steroids were bad. And uh, that, was, uh, that was right up front and a big part of their, their push. They came out with a very aggressive testing program for steroids and, and a very thorough uh, testing protocol for steroids. Uh, they had much stronger penalties for steroids. And, and as a result, in the Mitchell report, it reported that steroid use in, in baseball was down significantly. When they addressed the HGH or failed to address the HGH problem, Major League Baseball, they had no, uh, there was reluctance to put in any testing protocol regarding HGH. There was not the same message put out there on the street that HGH is bad. And not surprisingly, as a result, the report uh, indicated that HGH use was on the rise. Now, if, if you look at the, the problem that we are having that you have described already, where uh, the message is not out there among our young people, it is not out there in the public, there is a very mixed message because you got some of these athletes and uh, uh, sports figures, well, Stallone, uh, the actor there, saying HGH is good. There is a, there's, there's a real problem with the, I say, popular opinion regarding HGH. And it even comes to our, our laws. Our laws under Title III of the Controlled Substance Act includes steroids. It has very strong criminal penalties for, for mere possession of steroids without a, position, without a uh, prescription. We have no uh, prohibition for simple possession of HGH. There is no criminal penalty for that. And, and that is what I am getting at. That is something we here in Congress can control. And, and since you are the experts on this, and uh, you know, if I could uh, just you know, personally thank uh, uh, Dr. Pearls for your good work at uh, Boston Medical Center and, uh, and at Boston University, what do you think about the idea of including HGH in Title III to include all of these penalties to at least legislatively send out the signal that this is a seriously dangerous substance? I, um, I'm incredibly appreciative to the committee having this hearing in the first place to start to, um, not start to, but to, uh, to look at growth hormone and the public health concern that it represents. Um, and along with that, stiffer penalties such as making Schedule III I think is an excellent idea. Um, Already there are very important laws on the books to um, go after the distributors for illegally distributing, for distributing uh, growth hormone for illegal uses that include imprisonment and fines. But uh, adding it as a Schedule III um, has all kinds of great potential in terms of um, educating physicians as well. Uh, because right now I think it's a little fuzzy for a lot of doctors out there in terms of what the law really is. So I think that's also very important. Um, along with making it a Schedule III, though, I think it's very important to um, also do what Congress can to provide additional resources to the DEA, in particular, who's short on uh, staff and already has to pay a lot of attention to metaphenamines and heroin and other big drugs, and this will be one more on their list. So. Uh, giving them the additional resources that they need to um, to carry out their mission would be very important. The other thing I think is while you're at it, um, there are other hormones that go along with growth hormone. There's something called growth hormone stimulating hormone, and then there's what the already mentioned insulin growth factors. And as we've seen with other drugs, um, when one becomes hard to get. Uh, everybody starts looking out for one that is easy to get and is less expensive. When growth hormone, when, when uh, things clamp down heavy on growth hormone, they will start looking at growth hormone stimulating hormone and insulin growth factor, which are all part of the same endocrine axis. And I would think it would be good to add those to the list as well.
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask, I have a, a letter uh, to me, but it is actually testimony from Gary Wadler uh, from the World Anti-Doping Agency that I would just ask to be included in the record, if I may. Uh, without objection, that will be included Thank in you, the Thank you, Mr. Record. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have learned a ton here today, so I appreciate your, your holding the hearing, and I thank you for your testimony. Um, what percentage of the people that are using HGH or B12 would you say are using it exclusively without it being used in combination with anything else? Do you have any sense of what that would be? No, sir. Um, so my exposure to this comes again from reviewing seized medical records for the DEA from three anti-aging clinics. And um, I can't think of any instance where the growth hormone B12 was uh, used in isolation. It's, uh, they were always given with anabolic steroids and a number of other substances. And while we were talking about vitamins, I must all say that they were providing very expensive collections of a whole bunch of different vitamins, all along the idea of just making a lot of money. So the adults in this equation have figured out that HGH by itself and B12 by itself and other sort of vitamin supplements by themselves really are, are pretty useless for the goals they have, it sounds like. You said adults, well, I think it's the, it's the anti-aging physicians, the owners of these clinics and the compounding pharmacies that are selling the stuff that have realized that selling it in isolation is going to make for some angry clients mm -hmm. and that it's probably best to give this stuff in combination with other things so that they try and see some whatever benefit that might be. And that's all uh, without saying much about the side effects, I might add. Are, are they being explicit in the blogosphere about the fact that um, the, the, the discussion on the blogosphere, is it explicit about the fact that, you know, it's the combination of steroid use with a growth hormone or vitamin supplement? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Very explicit. Um, you look, it's amazing following these blogs how much time everybody is spending on, um, on what the right recipes and cocktails are and what works for whom. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> So it still gets us back to the, the steroid use as being the, that's the driver. I mean, that's, that's the aspiration is through that you enhance performance. And then these other things are sort of um, on the margin to help boost the effects of that. I, I think that's right. And I also, again, as, as was just intimated, this is not any kind of standard clinical trial. This is a bunch of uh, non-scientists, non-clinicians just trying to feel their way through this and saying, oh, this worked for me or this worked for, and, and without really any uh, monitoring for any long-term side effects or benefits for that matter. How much? complicity does, uh, without assuming it, um, how much complicity would you say there has to be on the part of medical professionals to help drive this uh, perception? In other words, if all, mm -hmm. if all of those who have the science at their disposal um, were emphatic on the point of the dangers that are involved, um, with steroid use uh, or the, the, the fact that B12 or HGH really doesn't help you do anything, then you would, you would imagine that would be a significant deterrent uh, to the use. Um, but the, the high incidence of use suggests that there is some, some complicity. And, and I'm in, wondering in terms how much of the um, In terms of the physicians who are illegally writing prescriptions for uh, hormone and steroids without ever seeing the patients or the owners and the physicians of the anti-aging clinics, it's not a matter of complicity. They are the driving force. Okay. And I'm running out of time, so let me ask you this question. I raised this in another hearing we had, but now I got some experts in front of me. I'd be curious for your perspective on this. Um, I bought my son one of these, um, these push-up kits, okay? 
So it's got some equipment with it, and it's got a video on how to use it. And then at the end of the video, it, lo and behold, it shows you two bottles of some kind of thing that you're supposed to take in conjunction with this regimen. What would that have been most likely, do you think? I mean, what? Hella good marketing. That's yeah. terrific marketing. My guess would be, if I had to guess, would be something like HGH, but it would be a releaser or it would be something you would take by mouth that is likely something that's relatively harmless except to your wallet. Okay, thank you. But that's purely a guess, Mr. Sarbanes. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Using it anyway. <laughs> is that for that. is that for the record, sir? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing and to the doctors who are witnesses, we certainly appreciate you appearing before the committee to let us know about some of the threats to public health. I want to just probe a little bit, and I think most of you have addressed uh, the overuse of HGAs. And I know there are a couple of conditions that occur with, normally when you have too much uh, HGH in the system. And I think uh, Dr. I want to be sure I pronounce your name. Uh, is it Schifflestein? Schliffstein. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a woman taking her husband's That was anabolic dosage. steroids. It was a steroid she took by mistake, right? Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, there's something called acromegaly. Right. And, of course, we know about gigantism. And uh, I would like any of you that can, um, can you describe the problems associated with acro, what is it, acromegaly? Okay, and uh, to us so we can understand it. And I see these hearings, uh, Mr. Chairman, as very helpful to the general public and certainly helpful to us because we live in this drug culture. You can't turn your TV on. You can't listen to the radio. That they're not pushing something over the counter or go talk to your doctor about this. And so I think our young people uh, believe that the way to live their lives and to enhance their abilities is to take some of these drugs. Now, some of these things occur in the body normally. So. Uh, Dr. Rogel, maybe I should start with you. Can you describe the problems associated with acromegaly? I'm actually going to let Dr. Pearls do it. He's a big people's doctor. I'm okay. a little people's doctor. Whoever, please. Well, acromegaly involves usually a tumor of the pituitary gland where it's making too much growth hormone. Um, and you'll see the facial uh, characteristics that was mentioned with Andre the Giant and so on, where they get a bossing of the forehead, they get an enlarged jaw, they can have an increased incidence of certain cancerous tumors, um, probably because of the effect of growth hormone in terms of the ability of a tumor to grow and to spread. They get uh, troubles with their heart and liver in particular because they get heart enlargement and liver enlargement and that doesn't necessarily make for a better functioning organ. Um, they get what's called insulin resistance, or they can have elevated blood sugars, and that can go on to develop to be diabetes. Um, they do have shortened lifespans, not increased lifespans. Um, and then there's all the other, you know, we had mentioned the enlarged hands and, and so on. Maybe you can tell us about if you can extrapolate uh, from the, this experience and uh, to the elderly, what can you mm -hmm. extrapolate from acromegaly to the um, elderly? Well, I first actually got interested in growth hormone because I run the New England Centenarian study, which is a large study of people who get to 100, and I'm a geriatrician who absolutely loves old people. And the very first concern um, for me was an anti-aging industry that was portraying old people in a ter terrible light, um, saying, you know, do you want to be demented and frail, uh, and really scaring the heck out of uh, a very important population, the baby boom population, 70 million strong individuals who are very actively aging. Um, 
right now and, and, and to first scare them and then say, oh, but by the way, we have the cure. And that would be growth hormone books like uh, uh, Stop the Clock, Reverse Aging Now, um, a huge number of websites popularizing this. And much of this happened, um, it began with a New England Journal of Medicine article in 1990 looking at growth hormone in a very small sample of older men um, and comparing uh, the two with and without growth hormone and basically, uh, unfortunately, a statement saying that it took 10 to 20 years of aging off of the person's uh, life. The New England Journal editors have since come out saying they rude the day that they ever allowed that statement to happen because it led in part to a blooming of this industry. Um, and what really surprised me was uh, with my review of these charts for the anti-aging clinics was that the vast majority of them are not older people. Um, it's again people in their late 20s, 30s, and 40s who are going for the kind of things we see the testimonials of, these good looking, strong, athletic types. Um, and I think unfortunately as a society we're very susceptible to looking at testimoni testimonials and taking them hook, line, and sinker. Um, but that's all this market is based on is testimonials and not real science. And I'm hoping that the elderly population, as you mentioned, are a relatively minor part of this very big public problem. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I have a few more minutes? I wanted to ask about uh, vitamin B12. Go ahead. And uh, before I get there, uh, I want to address this to uh, Dr. Rogo. Uh, so, Vester Stallone once told uh, the Today Show that HGA was just amino acids, just a collection of proteins, and uh, the body that the body already produces. And uh, how can 191 amino acids be all that dangerous? And <laughs> if they're just amino acids, so can you? Ma'am, there's one little problem with that. 191 amino acids probably aren't a problem. 191 amino acids hooked together that form a protein called HGH, that's what the problem is. So it's a little DNA in the middle of that to try to take these things and uh, make a growth hormone. And I suspect, as uh, some of you may have read uh, in the article in uh, last Wednesday in USA Today that Mr. Stallone said all of this was done by HGH, I am sure he took HGH. We are absolutely unsure the 17 or 23 other things that he said, and as you probably also read, I was quoted as saying exactly that in the USA Today. So yeah, he took HGH, but again, with HGH and anything else, I am a clinical scientist. I know how to do experiments. The biggest issue in most experiments, once they're properly designed, is what the dose is. We know precisely what the dose is when we do an experiment. These doses are way beyond that. They're taken in a different way, and so we really don't have the idea of how to go about testing or studying, as Dr. Schliffstein has, uh, has said. So that's the uh, long-winded answer to your question, ma'am. Thank you so much. And if I can shift now to injectable vitamin B12, and Dr. Shuren, uh, can you tell us this very briefly? I I'm out of my first period of questioning and into the second period. I'm almost out of time. But the appropriate use of the injectable vitamin B12? The appropriate use for the injectable vitamin B12 is for people who are unable to absorb the oral form of B12. <clears throat> Normally, if you have a perfectly normal gut, you can absorb vitamin B12 from your diet. Even people who are strict vegans who don't take vitamin B12 in their diet can take supplemental vitamin B12, which they usually do from yeast, and absorb it just fine. So it's people who've had, who've got pernicious anemia, people who have had bowel resections, some people who have inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, all need to get vitamin B12 by injection. Otherwise, it's perfectly appropriate and definitely safer to have it uh, by mouth. It's not dangerous by injection, uh, but it's not helpful either. It also means that there are syringes and needles around, which you know, whether it's the locker room or the home is, is not a small issue. I think, I think the, uh, the, the potential secondary uh, complications of having needles and syringes around is, is not a, tr a trivial issue. 
The Thank you, uh, Ms. Watson. I, mm -hmm. I think your time has expired. <laughs> it's been a couple Even of Even the time. extra time. Thank you so very sure. much, panel. I want to ask, uh, and, and you may want a second round, but I want to take a second round <laughs> and ask some questions of uh, Dr. Schlifstein. The, uh, Dr. Pearls treats the elderly, Dr. Rogel, the children, but you've been a, um, a, a sports doctor and you've dealt with athletes. In your experience with athletes, if they use uh, human growth hormone, are, are they more likely than not to be using it in conjunction with other drugs? I think almost in every case they're using it with other drugs. Um, there may be a period of time where they're only taking that and cycling off something else, but certainly um, it's the mainstay is using it with something else. So that's why a lot of times these talks about human growth hormone in isolation isn't really true or we shouldn't really just be talking about that. You have to talk it in combination with some type of anabolic steroid. If an athlete tells me that he's taking human growth hormone to, to heal from an, a sports injury, uh, how would you react to that? Is it credible? Is it, is it well, we, helpful? <clears throat> we really don't have any proof that it is beneficial in that manner. Um, certainly with its effect on both muscle and bone tissue, one could hypothesize that like a fracture or something else may heal uh, slightly faster than one without taking it. Um, I've seen some cases with people who have had fractures, young people taking human growth hormone and it healed a lot faster than normal. Was that the only factor involved? It's only a case report, so it's not really uh, scientific evidence, but, but possibly yes. And when an athlete uses it, these are expensive items, this human yeah. growth hormone, $1,000 a month, are they taking very high doses, do you expect? From your experience? From my experience with these people uh, and patients, um, what they've been taking, um, the dosing that someone would use for an HIV wasting syndrome, it can vary between a quarter and a half of that dosing. Because um, sometimes they get it from those patients as well, because they know they're getting legitimate sources of it and don't have to get a prescription themselves, and they get it and they buy it off those people. Who get it well, more likely than not, there are people hanging around that they tell them, just get me some human growth hormone. Well, these people get it automatically every month, and they know they get a certain amount. That's why I know how much they have of it based on mm -hmm. that dose. So it's already paid for and get gotten through and gotten regularly, and they know it's a legitimate source and a real source. Mm -hmm. And usually it's about half that dose, but that has dramatic effects on someone who's in their 20s or 30s. Uh, taking that large of a dose, uh, especially with whatever else they're taking. Uh, what do they think they're getting when they take a, a vitamin B15 shot? I mean, you can't take it orally, so they get a shot. What, what do they you think? Mean, are you referring to B12 shot? Yeah, uh, uh, B12. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're on the cutting Only edge. Three, three, uh, three numbers <laughs> off. Um, you know, I think a lot of that, I think, is a placebo effect. Um, if you're already doing so many injections and uh, you think you're going to get an energy boost from it and you have something that looks like red syrup and you think it's going to boost your energy, if you really believe in it, yeah, what's, what's another shot if you're already taking, you know, seven, ten a week anyway? If seven, you're not ten a week of B12? Injections. Injections of other, yeah. other drugs. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. the human growth hormone is usually once or twice a day. The anabolic steroid, depending on which one, oil-based or water-based, can be daily or twice a week. Um, I mean, insulin growth factor is even worse because they have to inject it into each individual muscle. So you'd have to do every muscle you worked out. Is so B15 injected in the muscle? Uh, B12 is a, uh, you keep saying B15. B12 yeah, is, injected is, um, in the muscle. Is a, usually it's an intramuscular uh, injection, yes. I see. How about lidocaine? Okay. Tell us about lidocaine and is it safe for a fitness trainer to inject someone with lidocaine or is it a dangerous drug? Well. Um, I don't think a fitness trainer should be injecting anything uh, or recommending anything either on that behalf. Um, but lidocaine uh, is used as a local anesthetic. Now as far as injections for pain management goes or for treatment of an injury, uh, very specific reasons and uses for it. Now it only is temporary, right? Short-lived, short-acting anesthetic. It just numbs the area temporarily and then two hours it's gone. So if someone has an inflamed or irritated joint, we may put some corticosteroid, an anti-inflammatory steroid, combined with some lidocaine, injected into a joint to get pain relief from an inflamed or irritated joint. The lidocaine gives some temporary short-term pain relief, while the anti-inflammatory or corticosteroid or cortisone takes time to work its anti-inflammatory effect. 
Now, that can be injected into a muscle. Yes, sometimes it can be injected into a muscle, usually with a, a corticosteroid or anti-inflammatory steroid as well, for pain relief into what we call a trigger point. Is this a dangerous drug? Um, it can be, depending on dose amount and frequency. Now, um, mm -hmm. usually a limited amount would be injected, uh, and if it's into a joint space, most of it tends to stay in that joint space. Injected into, into a muscle, there's going to be some systemic absorption. Um, it'll be a who, 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 who do you think should give this kind of an injection? You say not a, not a, uh, a oh, I mean, trainer. only a physician, and uh, I would say only a trained physician in that specialty. Um, what specialty? Sports medicine? Sports medicine or pain management, something where they know, you know, how much you're doing and where you're doing it. You can get other effects to nerves. You can do a nerve block by mistake. You can cause damage to that nerve. There are a lot of the potential problems with that. And when injecting into a muscle, you want it just into that muscle. You don't want to damage any other tissue. Yeah. If someone has a, what we call a trigger point, like back pain, and you put it into the muscle spasm, it helps that muscle relax, but only temporarily. And my last question, is it a performance enhancing drug, this lidocaine? Um, it, it's not a performance enhancing drug. It's purely a local anesthetic or local pain reliever. I see. Okay. Any, any other members wish more time? Mr. Bilbray? So lidocaine really just address the pain so it doesn't so something wouldn't hurt. Um, I guess the only way to performance enhancement would be to eliminate the pain so you'd go continue to perform without knowing that you're actually got damage going on there and probably create more damage. Right, which is a dangerous scenario because you're going to have an anesthetic or numb area uh, where you inject it. So potentially uh, during an athletic competition or event, there are serious concerns about doing that kind of injection because you're not going to have the normal feedback. Pain tends to be nature's way of telling you to slow down. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, those of us over 50 uh, relate to that. Uh, the, the B12 image of enhancement, is that the increased blood, red blood cells, thus the fact is that the blood's able to carry more oxygen, able to do that, is that the the image that's being given out on the B12. The, that's ex that's exactly right. The 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 benefits of receiving B12 if you are B12 deficient are all in exactly the areas where people want to have enhanced performance. You have more energy, your red count goes up, you have better memory, you have better concentration, uh, your nerve functions better. So all of those things are. Uh, clearly benefited if you are B12 deficient and you get treated with vitamin B12. And I think what's, ta what's happening is that they're extrapolating from that kind of situation to the idea that if you're starting A little here, is good, of, a whole lot is great. That's exactly right. And, and, and it's very clear that that is, in fact, not the case. <coughs> Mr. Bill Bray, I think there's a little confusion here. Most of the athletes who want that are taking erythropoietin rather than B12. And so EPO is another hormonal drug of abuse and uh, that's where metals were lost in Salt Lake City based on compounds like that. So there is quite a difference and most of the athletes are more likely to take erythropoietin than they are to take B12. Well, a lot, I mean, uh, B12 use is very, very common and I think what they're looking for is some of the same kind of benefit that they would also look for from erythropoietin. The big difference is that use of erythropoietin is not without major side effects. Use of erythropoietin is a serious business. Indeed. And that's, and that's actually, that's the uh, Tour de France problem as well. Okay, now let, when we focus on the problems, the problems, the problems, and, you know, trying to grasp for the answers, one of the things that I think that those of us here in the federal government have some jurisdiction specifically on and may be able to address is this issue of the network that is distributing the propaganda out to our young people, um, which is not necessarily over uh, the traditional airways, but over the new vehicle of communication for the next generation, that's the Internet. Was it fair to say that the Internet could be, you know, a major line of communication on, on not only uh, touting this, um, these substances, but also the, the possibility of distributing them? I think it's, the, it's a dangerous combination of both. You're getting information from the same place that's trying to sell you something. Of course, they're going to tell you the good sides or the potential good sides, or even if they're not even truth, uh, with the myths of it, but it's certainly not selling you the downsides. And that's the same source of information you're using to purchase the same something from, uh, which is a dangerous combination when you do the two together. Um, it goes beyond just um, 
individuals on the internet marketing and, uh, and pushing this stuff. Um, there's coordinated efforts between clinicians or these clinics and the compounding pharmacies. There were a number of drug busts. Raw Deal was one of them. Another one is something called Witch Doctor, um, that these operations conducted by the DEA and others that show that there are coordinated efforts between these entities to push and market the stuff, to go into gyms and, uh, and sports spas to actually recruit individuals to take the drug and then they get a kickback for that. There are much larger, almost what, pseudo medical societies um, bent around anti-aging that have courses and symposia on how to take the, how to deliver the drug, how to have uh, successful anti-aging practices. They produce books. They, they produce very large conventions, both nationally and internationally, where they bring all these folks under one roof. So you've got a whole network, and the internet, though, was a major part of that. Sure. Well, they have their websites and what have you. Even on among there. those groups that but basically the internet, are working. The up. internet is most dangerous. Um, because of such easy access by the by everyone, um, and then there's especially very at the high risk population. Right, young males wanting to. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to raise that issue because I think that one of the things that um, we have had a success in the past working on, and in fact, you and I worked on uh, the telecommunication bill over the Energy and Commerce back in the 90s of addressing the use of the Internet um, as a predatory vehicle on young people, I have a feeling that we ought to be um, looking at um, the Internet as being part of the answer to this issue of those who are using these predatory activities for um, selling these, these drugs and uh, really trying to address how we monitor and able to regulate the Internet to, to at least try to obstruct it from being a fast track to uh, uh, substance abuse. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, it would be Mr. Lynch first if you want more time, at, and Ms. Watson if she wishes more time. Just briefly, uh, on that same topic, again, uh, I do know that the difficulty in policing some drugs, uh, such as OxyContin, was that doctors, individual physicians, had the right to, to prescribe them so called off, off label for for reasons and for uh, situations that weren't necessarily the, the primary reason for certain medications. Interestingly enough, HGH is one of the very rare examples. I can think of no other drug that, that we've investigated up here that has a prohibition that says you can't prescribe this off-label. And that's what, that's what the FDA says about HGH. So all of this stuff whether it's on the Internet or whether it's in the mail or whether it's, uh, you know, within these gyms, all of this stuff is right now off-label. It is prohibited uh, flatly by the FDA. So since we, I think we already have the tools to stop this. And uh, I, I just want to know, you know, from our panelists, uh, is, it, is it a matter of enforcement uh, that, that, that we're falling down on here? Or do you think there is some other, uh, you know, prohibition maybe regarding the Internet? I just think that's the vehicle. The, 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 that's just one way of selling this stuff. I, I think that we have the tools already to, to stop this if we were serious about it. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. I presume that's correct if it really is human growth hormone. That's precisely the drug that the FDA talked about. But I could see the biggest amount of wiggle room with things that aren't HGH because they, they say, well, this is not proscribed. So that's where I think there might be a lot of difficulty because it's my opinion. I haven't looked at the Internet sites, but it is my opinion that the vast majority of the hype for this are things other than the 191 amino acid drug HGH. And so nice. that might be another avenue to look at. It's just a little bit different than what you said, sir. No, that, that's very good, doctor. That's, that explains a lot. Anybody else, Dr. Pearls? Um, I'd actually degree, uh, disagree with the amount of hype and literature uh, and marketing that I've seen around growth hormone, the injectable, is, is unfathomable and, the, uh, and that it does represent a $2 billion a year market for the um, what we would call the off-label indications of growth hormone. 
um, or the illegal indications. The, the laws are, are there to prevent the illegal distribution or to, to try and prevent the illegal distribution, but it doesn't get to possession, as you have mentioned. And I do think that calling something a Schedule Three has a great deal of education benefit to the people who prescribe the drug. Um, there's, uh, I think it became a big problem. Um, uh, it's, it's been going on for about 17 years and it's been pretty much under the radar because it is a fairly obscure uh, rule. You said it's, it's unique and it is. So um, I think taking uh, the extra steps to bring it out of obscurity is very important and uh, a, a bill to make it Schedule 3 I think would very much help in that vein. And then of course there's, a, there's providing the resources to go after it. I think another big problem is, is a, a very overstretched FDA and DEA and their ability to deal with all the things that they have to deal with. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Watson, do you wish to ask further questions? Very quickly, I wanted to raise an issue about lidocaine. Just recently, we uh, saw a very tragic news story about a young lady who was uh, on her way, as we understand, to the laser hair removal clinic and spread lidocaine cream all over her leg and, I guess, her body. And uh, she had a seizure, collapsed, and died. Can someone comment on the cream that you can get? And should it be controlled by a professional? I don't know about the cream, but that I was going to mention before, lidocaine is a drug that affects uh, electrical activity, whether it's of your heart or your brain. And so when physicians appropriately inject into a joint, shoulder, uh, knee are the usual ones, no problem. But when it gets systemic, that's when you have the problems. And so cardiac and brain arrhythmias, which in essence is what a seizure is, uh, are a known side effect of that particular drug. Right. I mean, it would have to be taken in very large quantities uh, through the skin uh, to be absorbed that way. Now, you can get it over the counter, which is like 1 percent. Uh, prescription strength is 5 percent. Uh, there's also a topical patch, which is lidoderm, which is lidocaine in a patch, which is 5 percent. Now, if you keep doing that, your body's going to absorb more and more, and eventually you'll get into your bloodstream, and you probably build it up over time. Um, lidocaine is also an antiarrhythmic, meaning it's usually to prevent heart from having arrhythmias. But like any antiarrhythmic, it can be pro-arrhythmic. And it also affects the electrical conductivity of your heart, but it certainly can affect the electrical conductivity of your brain. I think the perception is a certain over-the-counter, or if it's a topical medication, perception is I, I can't take too much, it won't get absorbed. Um, there have been cases of people uh, from taking the topical aspirin creams who have died. Uh, from salicylate toxicity or aspirin toxicity. Just because they perceive it as benign, they're putting a patch on, they're putting a cream on, they don't think they're going to be affected that way. Lidocaine would have to be taken in pretty large quantity to be absorbed that have that effect. If you left three patches on for 24 hours a day, you'd only have about a 1% absorption into your bloodstream. So it would probably have to be uh, a large dose and a continual dose to do that. Um, but some patients, if they're given that, you know, they need instruction on how to take it appropriately. Um, just because you put more on doesn't mean that area is going to get more numb or penetrate deeper. It really only works superficially. And I think people who are getting a procedure and want to anesthetize and someone prescribes that have to give appropriate instruction on use of that medication. But what, what I'd like to have clarified, how much is too much of the cream? Um, I mean, really it has to only go on that area locally and it has to be on there a half hour beforehand. So if you were just doing your head, you just need enough to cover it. You don't, once it's numb, it's not going to get more numb, you know? It's not going to go deeper. Uh, so it's really going to, and it's going to last uh, two or three hours. That's how long it lasts. Uh, moron is not going to make it last longer or be more numb. Either it's anesthetized or it's not. There's no in between. Um, Usually, I mean, those tubes come in uh, large amounts, which is usually enough for, you know, weeks, if not a month. Um, at most, we apply twice a day because uh, it will stay uh, some absorbed in the adipose or fat tissue on the subcutaneous tissue. I mean, just under the skin, there will be a little residual buildup. If you continue to use it, you will get a continual buildup of additional lidocaine. So it probably wasn't a one-time use. It was probably a continual use. and probably had to put a, a lot of cream on in order for that to occur. 
But you know, if you weren't instructed properly, you probably wouldn't know any better. And if they had it ahead of time before a procedure, someone's nervous, they're going to keep doing it just to hopefully have less problems later. Would the gentle, gentle lady yield to me? Yes, I'm finished. Finish. Thank you so okay, much. Thanks. Well, what if you, if you heard about a professional athlete who had a lidocaine injection but didn't go to a physician, what risks is that person taking? Well, I think a lot. Um, I think even uh, a lot of physicians wouldn't inject lidocaine without a lot of experience in doing it, especially depending what part of the body you're doing it into. Um, certainly uh, there are nerves that go all over the body. Um, just as we talked about absorption from a topical, if you hit a blood vessel, it can be absorbed and you can have an arrhythmia or a seizure if it goes into a blood vessel because it will get absorbed really quickly. Um, so I mean I would say only a medical doctor and only one really trained in doing those and experienced in doing those procedures. Otherwise um, that's when it's something that it seems like a benign drug, but let's remember it is a drug uh, and certainly an injectable makes the uh, risk of anything more dramatic. Uh, absorption into the blood, where we can get a, uh, you can get a problem like that to occur, uh, is a real possibility. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, this panel, I want to thank you all very much. You've done uh, an excellent job in outlining the issues for us, not just as it relates to professional athletes, uh, but to the whole range of the population. And I think it's dispelled uh, a lot of myths, and it's also been very educational uh, for us and for the American people. I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent that the record be held open for two weeks. There may be additional questions that we might ask you to respond to in writing. Just a 30 second. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, my uh, Thank colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chase. I just wanted to thank you for holding this hearings and thank our witnesses. I know all the questions have been asked that needed to be, but uh, I think it's important that you're doing this, and I think it will lead to some insights on the part of the government and some action both in the, by the part of the government and the private sector uh, and the sports community that I think ultimately will have significant benefit. So thank you. Thank you. That's our, certainly our hope, and we're going to work with you and others to try to achieve that goal. Thank you very much for being here. That uh, concludes our hearing. We stand adjourned. Waiting to hear from the president. Uh, we'll take you live to the White House in a few moments. Uh, president Bush expected to uh, have comments on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provisions that were passed yesterday by the Senate. That bill is under negotiation today in the House. Again, we'll take you live to the White House for those remarks in just a, a few moments here on C-SPAN 2. <laughs>
Again, uh, momentarily, we expect to hear from President Bush on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provisions that were uh, passed by.